Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning to worship you and to proclaim that your name is holy because you are holy. For we come here this morning to worship you because your word reveals to us all that you are. And I pray this morning in Jesus' name that your Holy Spirit would move in us, informing us and teaching us all that you are. And that, Lord, you would help me to get out of the way, that you might speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Last week, we began a series on what it means to worship God. I felt the need to start with what it means for us as individuals. And we're going to continue that today. Next week, we're going to turn and see what it looks like to to worship God corporately as, as the people of God. But we begin last week by seeing that we were created to worship God. Which should be the most natural thing for us as creatures. It comes naturally when we are in fellowship with God. We were created as those who bore the image of our creator. And I quoted N.T. Wright who writes, we're designed to function like angled mirrors. We are created in order to reflect the worship of all creation back to the creator. And by the same means to reflect the wise sovereignty of the creator into the world. Human beings worshiping their creator were thus the intended key to the proper flourishing of the world. I mean, worship was to be a matter of gazing with delight and gratitude and love for the Creator. And it should result in in using creative expressions even in our actions, in music and in art and in all that we do. And this is how the world will know the living God, through those who are praising Him and living their lives in worship. This is how God reveals Himself through His redeemed humanity. We saw that actually sin was not just a matter of of breaking rules. It was a matter of failing to worship the Creator. And instead worshiping the creature. Whether that be us or something else that's not designed for worship. We saw last week how Jesus spoke to the woman at the well from John 4, 23-24. But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. And we saw last week how creation is a constant reminder that the God who created all things is able to recreate in us the image and ultimately to restore all of creation. Creation itself is the revelation of God who is spirit. That he has condescended to come down to us in bodily form and dwell in our midst in the person of Jesus Christ. In doing so, he revealed the truth of his love and his mercy. But also that he he alone was to be the object of our desire. And anything else is idolatry. Today I want us to focus on what the Word of God reveals to us about who it is that we are worshiping and why we should give our lives and all that we have to Him. In talking with people in the community, I often hear them refer to God as the man upstairs. And they claim to have some appreciation or some understanding with this fellow. One man told me that he and the man upstairs had an understanding and that he was fine just the way he was. And he's revealing something to me that was very important. He did not know the God of Scripture. But instead he had created a God that fit into his view of things. A God who did not hold him accountable, but that a God who was supposed to do what God does and to be there to meet every need that he has and to protect him. Now, you may be tempted to shake your head and at such a foolish attitude about God, but I'm afraid 
that this problem is more of a common attitude in the church and we may like to admit. It just usually takes a different form. Most people who attend church would not likely speak of God in the same way as this, but the attitude is very similar. Somehow God is there for their benefit, but giving up everything for him is going just a bit too far, or is it? This is an important question. The definition of worship in, in Webster's Dictionary is to adorn, to adorn, to esteem worthy, to pay reverence, to have homage. But what's the definition of biblical worship? This is an important question because if Christianity is God in Christ restoring the marred image of God and transforming the image into worshipers of God, that it's imperative that Christians know what Christian worship really is. Biblical worship is an attitude and it's an act that's informed by the revelation of who God is and the response to that revelation. In order to experience true biblical worship, as individuals and as a church, we must first understand who it is and what he says about himself that we are to worship. Because God is clearly seen through the revelation of himself through his word and his Holy Spirit. Psalm 138, 1 and 2 says, I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and I give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. God has exalted all things. All things. His name and his word are above all things. Because his name reveals to us who it is that we are to worship and why we are to worship him. We know what God is like not only by creation and the wonder of his works, but by the way he describes his character and his nature, which are found in his names. For many of the names God or Lord reveal nothing more than a divine sort of being. But it doesn't really reveal to them anything about his character. And we should understand our responsibility to worship and place our hope in him because of his names. Years ago, a friend brought me a, a wooden cross that we have on, on our living room wall. And in the center of that cross, it just says Jesus. Now that's a name that's near and dear to my heart. When I hear the name Jesus, it gladdens my heart. But all around that name, it says Morning Star. Lord, giver of life, King of kings, Messiah, Son of God, Word, wonderful counselor, good shepherd, Emmanuel, Lamb of God, comforter, Prince of peace, Savior, bread of life, wonderful counselor. Each of these are descriptions from God's Word, but it tells me so much more about Jesus that causes me to see more clearly why I follow him and why I fall down and I worship him and that he is worthy of my praise and my adoration. He is worthy of my honor. I have a t-shirt that has a picture of a lion on it and, and the, the scripture from Hosea 11.10 that says, they will follow the Lord and he will roar like a lion. And below that it says, reads, Jesus Christ, the lion of Judah. And every time I wear it, usually to the gym, it reminds me that my God is the Lion of Judah. And he's coming back to claim what is his. And he should be honored and feared. He's not a pet, like a cat that's there for me to pet adoringly. Nobody, when a lion walks into the room, goes, ah. Oh. Everybody pays close attention to a lion. God's name reveals his power and his authority. 
And it should be noted that it was God who gave us his names. He did not wait for Israel to, to come up with pet names about how they felt about him. He said, this is who I am. And there, a while ago, I did a study on the names of God and it brought me to my knees. There are seven basic names for God in scripture, but after there's names, there's always a description of the character of that name, of something about that name. For example, the Hebrew word Elohim. It's a plural form of the, of the word El, which means strong one. It can refer to any God, actually. But Elohim is a plural form that is speaking to us of majesty, and it intimates the Trinity. It's plural. It's especially used of God's sovereignty and, and creative work and action on behalf of Israel. Isaiah 40, 54, 5 says, For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. The God of the whole earth he is called. In this one passage, and just that one passage, Israel could see enough about their God to bow before him in praise and adoration. The prophet is proclaiming that their creator is their husband, that they are his bride, and his name is Jehovah. And this is a name that they understood. They knew that God was called Jehovah, and it meant Holy One. And he's the one that was going to redeem them from oppression. Elohim is the word used for the God of the whole earth. And so by focusing on this one passage, just the names of God in that one passage. They should have understood enough about God to bring them to their knees in grateful worship and praise. In Genesis 17, 1, God reveals himself to Abraham. and He claims, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. Why? Because I'm God Almighty. I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. The one who has universal dominion. And Abraham should be faithful to him because of that reason alone. Earlier in Genesis 14, 9, Melchizedek is blessing Abraham, or Abram at that time. And he said, Bless be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be the God most high who delivered your enemies into your hand. And God here is referred to as El Elyon, which means God most high. And Hagar and Genesis 16, 13 refer, refers to God as El Olam. Means the everlasting God, the God who will always be. The most common name for God in the Old Testament is Jehovah or Yahweh, depending on the translation and what time they're actually... That's another discussion. We'll use Jehovah. <laughs> it emphasizes God's unchangeableness and the fact that he will not wear out. That's good to know, isn't it? Amen. Exodus 3 begins the story of, of God through a burning bush speaking to Moses to go to Egypt to rescue the people of Israel from Egypt, from their bondage and oppression. And Moses asked God, well, who should I tell them sent me? God, Elohim, said to Moses, I am who I am. And this is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Say this to the people of Israel. The Lord, Jehovah, the God Elohim of your fathers, the God Elohim of Abraham, the God Elohim of Isaac, the God Elohim of Jacob has sent me to you. And this is my name forever and thus should be remembered throughout all generations. And we see Jehovah, there are many titles that reveal additional facts about who Jehovah is and what are his character. And many of these are familiar with a lot of you, I'm sure, like Jehovah Jireh. We pray that a lot because it means the Lord will provide. Or Jehovah Nisi, which means the Lord is my banner. He's the one that goes before me and fights on my behalf. Or Jehovah Shalom, the, the Lord is my peace. Jehovah Roy, the Lord is my shepherd. And Jehovah Shammah, the Lord 
is there. Which in Ezekiel 48, 35, was, God was promising through His name that His presence would always be in His kingdom. They could count on it because that's my name. And the list goes on and on in describing the names of God. Adonai is another word used to explain that God is majestic and it stresses man's relationship to God as their master, their authority, and their provider. While Moses and the children of Israel wander in the desert for 40 years, God reveals himself to them in so many ways and Moses writes down the stories of their encounters with God so that Israel will always remember that this is their God and they should be faithful to Him and worship Him only. When God brings Israel across the Red Sea to dry land, Moses and his sister Miriam write a song and they sing this song to Israel. Listen to Exodus 15 verses 2 and 3 with an ear for the name of God and the description of who they now know that He is. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. And this is my God and I will praise Him. My Father's God and I will exalt Him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is His name. The Lord, Jehovah, has become my salvation. And I want you to understand that the word used for salvation here in the Hebrew is Yeshua. Name ring a bell? It's the word of Jesus, the name for Jesus in Hebrew. Israel is being reminded to sing that God was their strength and their salvation. Jehovah has become my Yeshua. They now know that they they could do anything that God had asked them to do, that they could go now into the promised land without fear because they knew something else about God, that He was a warrior. That he would fight on their behalf. He had declared his name. I am the Lord. I am Jehovah. And I am a warrior. And they found time and again that he was their deliverer. Their provision. Their strength. He was everlasting. He was over all of creation. And they were taught to praise him using the names that he had revealed to them. And his name was to be holy. And they were not to profane it or to take it in vain. The priests of Israel were to minister in the name of the Lord. And calling on the name of the Lord was actually an act of worship. Because there's power in the name of the Lord. To minister in the name of the Lord or the name of God was a summary summary statement embodying the entire person of God. When we say That we're going out in the name of Jesus. We're saying, I'm going out in the name that is above all names. The name that has everything, all the connotations of him is wrapped up in that name. And that's why I go out in authority in that name. So the question is, with all this experience and history, how could Israel even be tempted to follow after other gods? God had revealed himself in such powerful ways and gave them so many examples of of faithfulness. And yet they quickly turned aside to follow after other gods made of wood or, or stone or metal. God had declared to them, I am your God and you are my people. In other words, when God declared I am the God of your fathers. Israel was to declare, He is the God of our fathers. But they would not. The prophets had warned them and they wouldn't listen. In 1 Kings 18, 21, Elijah confronted the people of Israel on Mount Carmel. And he said, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if by all is God, follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. 
The Lord speaks through Isaiah the prophet about what was coming upon Israel because of their foolishness. And in Isaiah 29, 13, and 14, I'm going to read it through the, the transliteration of the message. I love the way he, print, he, he, he posted here. So these people make a big show of saying the right things, but their hearts aren't in it because they act like they're worshiping me but don't mean it. I'm going to step in and shock them awake, astonish them, stand them on their ears. The wise ones who had it all figured out will be exposed as fools. And the smart people who thought they knew everything will turn out to know nothing. Consider our Old Testament reading this morning from 1 Chronicles 16, 23 through 27. Sing to the Lord, Jehovah, all the earth. Tell of his salvation, Yeshua. From day to day, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, great is Jehovah, and greatly to be praised, and he is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord Yeshua, the Lord Jehovah, made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. This is to be the heart of the people of God. And the chronicler is not only giving them a command, but he's giving them the reasons why the command should be obeyed. This is our God and he is worthy to be revered. He is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to be worshipped. Israel refused. But praise God that he still continued his plan of redemption. As we turn to the New Testament, we find once again that God is going to reveal himself through his name. At this time, it'll be the living bodily presence of the name of Yeshua, which means the salvation of God. John 1, 12, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. In other words, they believed that Yeshua was indeed the God of their salvation, and they bowed before him. In Matthew 18, 20, the believers were to gather together in his name. In John 14, 13 and 14, prayer is to be made in his name. It is the name of Jesus that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. In Philippians 2, 10 and 11. In the New Testament, the most common term for God in the Greek is theos. And it's the equivalent of Elohim, meaning the only true God. This is the word used to describe Jesus in John 1.18, where it says, No one has ever seen theos, or God. The only theos who is at the Father's hand, at his side, but he has made him known. The Father has made it known that Jesus is Theos. He is God. And we should bow down before him. And that's why he should be seen as our salvation and worshiped. God came in the flesh to continue to demonstrate his character and his nature. But this time he came in a way that that men could see and understand and to demonstrate his love for us by paying the price for our sins. But in John 20, 28, Thomas, upon seeing the risen Savior, finally has this moment of absolute clarity for the first time in his life. And he declares, my Lord, Kyrios, or Master, and my God, Theos. That was the moment of Thomas's confession. And it became worship, and that became his salvation. And he showed that this was indeed true about him because he lived into that confession. Jesus was Yeshua, who he now knew was Theos. And he gave his life to it. And he realized it was worth living and dying for. And he did. In the scriptures, Old and New Testament, that. There are 931 examples of the name of God with various descriptions as to who he is. 
it's kind of clear that God desires we know who He is so that we can respond to Him in worship. And the reason, the reason that Jesus was so hard on the religious leaders of His day was that they put on the appearance of righteousness, but their hearts revealed that they did not know and they did not worship I Am. Instead, they hated him for declaring that that's who he was. In John 8, 58, he says, I tell you the truth before Abraham was, I am. And they picked up stones to throw at him, but he hid himself. It's a very different response than Thomas, isn't it? But unlike Thomas, the Pharisees did not believe that Jesus was who he claimed to be. When you know him, you will follow him and you will worship him. You can't help it. It's the only reasonable response. And by necessity, it will change you. One thing becomes clear when you consider God's word and you decide to follow and worship Jesus. There is no following him a little bit. It's all or nothing. I once heard John Hagee say, Jesus is either Lord of all or not at all. And to that I say a hearty amen. If I know that I'm supposed to go to New York City, I cannot run down 95 South to get there because I prefer going in that direction. It will not lead me to New York City and there's no use in claiming that my destination is New York City if I'm not willing to go that way. You cannot claim to be a follower of Christ and only follow Him a little bit. But instead, you follow him wherever he leads. You're either pursuing Jesus or you're not. And it does not take long to see what you're pursuing by what it is you're worshiping. The names of God tell us who he is and why he is worthy of our praise. And the commands of God show us how he wants us to live. And Jesus' death and resurrection provides the way. And the Holy Spirit provides the power and the ability to follow through. Have you chosen to follow Jesus wherever he leads you? Or have you tried to follow him just a little bit? Pay attention to the names of God. And they will lead you to your knees. The psalmist reminds us as to how we are to think and live. In Psalm 96, this morning, the first few verses, we were, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless His name. Tell of His salvation day from day to day. Declare His glory among the nations. His marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. Elijah's exhortation to Israel on Mount Carmel is still before us today. How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow Him. But if you fill in the blank, follow Him. Israel chose not to respond, which was a response. What about you this morning? What is your answer to the call of Jesus upon your life? My prayer is that each of us here this morning will see through the names of God that He is worthy of our surrender and of our faithful obedience. There is no other way to salvation in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before we come to the Nicene Creed, I want us to take a few moments of reflection just to bow before the Lord, to invite the Lord and His names to penetrate our hearts. Feel free to come to the altar if you want to pray.